Saints 2's main deficiency, however, isn't the graphics, gameplay, or anything technical. It just doesn't hold a candle to GTA's signature style. Not one character in the entire cast stands out as anything other than generic. The City 2 is an uninspired, washed-out metropolis. 1-Up My main issue with the game is that while the element of fun makes the game quirky and amusing to play, Underneath, I can't find the defining factor as to why I don't enjoy it as much. Whether it is because a certain unnamed open-world action title has already been released this year, and showed us what the potential of the console can do, then perhaps that is why. Console Monster There is no comparison to Grand Theft Auto 4 in terms of gunplay, presentation, story, ambient city life, or driving. Rockstar has this beat by a country mile. But while Rose's lack of polish and rough exterior make it the less attractive choice from a technical standpoint, for those who felt shortchanged by GTA 4's scaled-back features, especially compared to San Andreas, Saints Row 2 will help fill the void. G4 TV There's no question that GTA 4 is a better game than Saints Row 2, but in some ways, Saints Row 2 is more fun. Saints Row 2 doesn't look nearly as good, and there aren't any heavy moral choices or resonant melodrama, but the cars handle more easily, cops are less of a concern, enemies are easier to kill, and the activities are generally crazier and more over the top. If GTA 4 got too serious for you, Saints Row 2 might just be what you're looking for. Giant Bomb You know what sucks? Living in someone else's shadow. No matter how well you're doing, or how great your own accomplishments are, it doesn't matter because you end up compared to someone else doing better than you, and in turn, diminishing your own successes. I'm sure we've all felt that way at some point throughout our lives. Being compared to a sibling, relative, friend, or co-worker who is always doing just a little bit better than you, it sucks. But as we grow as people, we inevitably step out of that shadow, usually by learning not to care about that other person, and taking pride in ourselves and what we've done. But what if we went in another direction? Changing ourselves, changing what we do, becoming something so different we could never possibly be compared to that other person. Think like how as a teenager you might have gone through some phase for a few months, like going goth, becoming a scene kid, taking up skateboarding, starting a band, going vegan, converting to a new religion, or whatever. The point I'm trying to make and the reason I opened the video by reading reviews of Saints Row 2 was that clearly Volition didn't like living in GTA's shadow. So they pivoted the series in a direction that, while at the time proved successful financially, easily outselling the first two games, it would ultimately lead to the series' doom. Twice. I'll be upfront, I really like Saints Row the Third. I'm not going to pretend I got red-pilled and woke up to realize it was trash and the original two games shit all over it. I'm not some woke YouTuber who had an awakening in college that the American Pie movies are bad, or misogynistic or whatever. Fuck that. Those movies are awesome, and Stifler is still the greatest. Ladies, I'm Steve Stifler, and I have an 11-inch penis. Alright. Think about it. This game was a lot of fun and got me into the series. A journey I've really enjoyed, especially since I got to make videos discussing it. It's certainly not without its flaws. Some much more obvious now that I'm looking at it in a critical light, and have the first two games to compare it to and I can't fault the original fans for hating it. But playing the first two games didn't completely sour my opinion of the third, so I'm not going to be shitting all over it. Instead, I'll be discussing what it does good and bad compared to the first two games, and how Saints Row tried to find this unique identity for itself. An identity that worked, until it flew too close to the sun with the fourth game, and how it successfully brought in its user base, but unfortunately ended up leaving the original fans behind. This video will cover the original release by the way and not the remaster. I already owned Saints Row the Third and didn't feel like poning up 40 bucks for prettier graphics. Though the cutscenes are a bit of a mess on PC, apparently they were capped at 30 frames per second on console, and when it was ported to Steam it just kind of made them worse. But oh well. So one thing I want to discuss and work to explain some of the bigger changes this game brought about 
is the fact that Saints Row the Third is not a sequel to the first two games. It's actually a soft reboot of the series. Some of you are probably scratching your heads and others are probably typing away at an argument in the comments, but let me explain myself here. First, let's define what is a sequel, a reboot, and a soft reboot. A sequel is fairly straightforward. The next installment of an existing story or series. Think Terminator 2 to the original movie. It continues the story of the first one of a future war between humans and machines. Brings back the protagonist from the last movie, Sarah Connor. Maintains continuity as another robot is sent back in time to kill the leader of the human rebellion. John Connor. This time when he's a teenager instead of before he was born. And adds to the story as we find out how Skynet ended up being created. That we have a new and more powerful liquid terminator. And that the future can in fact be changed. And the movie ends with some great irony. As the heroes destroy Skynet before it can be created. Preventing Judgment Day, the future war, and saving all of humanity. It's the definition of a perfect sequel. And really, really should have ended here. And never had any more movies made. Especially Dark Fate. Fuck that movie. Now a reboot resets the story or continuity of a series. Starting with a fresh slate. Ignoring everything that came before it. And starting a new story with a similar but different version of our protagonist. For example, let's go with Tomb Raider 2013. It gave us a younger, more inexperienced Laura Croft. Ignored everything that came before it. And changed up the gameplay to be something closer to Uncharted. It also started that trend of giving female protagonists a generic tank top and pants. Cause god forbid a woman ever show a little bit of skin in today's modern gaming world. A soft reboot basically mixes both concepts. It keeps some of the same characters, loosely references its past, but changes the setting and the story can stand on its own without knowing anything that preceded it. Best example is God of War 2018. We still got Kratos, but he's left behind his Greek roots for a world set around Norse mythology. Kratos went from an angry murder machine, desperate to move past and forget the horrible sins he's committed, and dropping his obsession with killing the gods who betrayed him, mostly because he killed all of them. Now he's a stoic father, trying to relate to his son and avoid slipping back into the person he used to be. Gameplay went from an over-the-top, gory hack-and-slash combat, to a third person cinematic action game. You're not required to play any of the games in the Greek saga to follow and understand the plot of this game, but it helps to appreciate Kratos' journey. It's funny, it wasn't until I did my God of War video that I realized how divisive the change to the series was. While I enjoy the newer God of Wars, I still prefer the originals over it. Gameplay was faster, the puzzles didn't hold your hand, and Kratos wasn't really this one-note edgy character that game journalists seem to think he was. Also, I don't really like that the developers look at it as something to be ashamed of, but that's a discussion for another video. So, taking what I just explained in mind, how is Saints Row the Third a soft reboot? For one, while you're still playing as the same character from the last two games, just known as the boss, they've really mellowed out this time around, not really the borderline unlikable sociopath they were in the last game. Next, your accomplishments in Stillwater boils down to how notorious the Saints were, but with little specifics to what they actually did. Also, we're no longer in Stillwater, but in the new city of Steelport. Next, while we do have some returning characters from the last game, some don't stick around long enough to impact the plot, or are so radically different from the last game, they don't even resemble the character they used to be. Ooh boy, so much I want to say about that right now, but I need to save it for a little later in the video. And finally, it's the tone, and how the Saints are perceived. The Saints went from a gang rising in power, initially conceived to take down the other gangs in Stillwater and bring peace to the city, to just becoming as bad as the other gangs and taking over the city. But in this game, for some reason, they're now treated as these big criminal celebrities. The average person on the street is now eager to get their autograph. Homies in the gang are sponsored by big companies and the gang are even in talks to get their own movie soon. Needless to say, that last one is the most contentious change with the game. As while the last two Saints Row could certainly get ridiculous, it still maintained a somewhat serious and grounded tone, and would always portray the gang negatively in the eyes of the public and law enforcement. Now on paper, a soft reboot isn't a bad idea. Some series have had stinker after stinker, or were weighed down by the baggage of continuity. A fresh slate helps keep things focused without completely redoing everything. 
Comics do it all the time. After a shitty run from one comic book writer, the next one ignores all the bad shit, keeps the cliff notes of important plot points, and tries their best to write the ship. It's a way to attract new fans and avoid intimidating them with the requirement of playing previous games first before they can jump into the next one. The real issue here is that Saints Row the Third released only three years after the second game. And more importantly, the first two games still reviewed and sold rather well. Not quite GTA numbers, sure, but most games don't ever get close to those numbers. So trying to retool the series and change course, seemingly out of nowhere and for no reason, can come off very jarring to fans, when realistically, it probably didn't need it at all. Now a lot of games, movies, or series will try their best to hide a genre shift, or what they've completely changed in a bid to try and keep old fans while attracting new ones. A good chunk of it doesn't work, basically boiling down to a bait and switch. See Disney Star Wars or any property with a massive male fan base that tries to retool itself to be pro-feminist for some reason. To Volition's credit, they don't really do that. From the very beginning of the game, you know this isn't going to be like the previous two games. When done well, a game's opening will set the right expectation for its tone and communicate to the player what they're getting into. Saints Row 1 opens with a three-way gang war and your playable character about to become another statistic before he's saved by the Saints and recruited afterwards. Saints Row 2 starts with the boss waking up from a coma in jail, a new character filling them in on what happened while they were out, and then leading into a huge jailbreak. Saints Row the Third starts with a Star Wars-style text crawl explaining how awesome the saints are, how they grew into a media empire, and have a movie on the way. Then we get an ad of Pierce selling some Saints Row branded drink in Japan, before cutting to Johnny Gat, Shandi, The Boss, and some movie star about to rob a bank, while wearing giant Johnny Gat bobblehead masks. So yeah, one of these things is clearly way, way different than the others. Also, Shandi doesn't quite look like she used to, does she? but I'll open that can of worms when I get to discussing the characters. The bank robbery doesn't quite go as planned, as the cops end up arresting the saints, and while they do get bailed out, they're immediately taken to see the man whose money they attempted to steal, Philippe Loren, leader of the criminal organization known as the Syndicate. Really swung for the fences with that creative name volition. After their meeting sours, the saints find themselves in the neighboring city of Steelport. All their assets gone, and now number one on the syndicate shit list. So it's up to the boss to rebuild the group's strength, take control of this new city, recruit some new homies, and eventually get revenge on the syndicate for Johnny's death. Yeah, that's the other big controversial change with this game. They killed off Johnny Gat, arguably the most popular character in the franchise and its mascot. Well, did he go down in some awesome blaze of glory? We're about to jump! Right on. I'll see you in still. Johnny? Fuck no. He gets killed off screen while on the phone with you. In a way so damn anticlimactic that when I first played the game, I was convinced it was an obvious fake out. That they either held Johnny captive or he'd come to the rescue at the end of the game. But nope, he really did die. They're even holding a funeral for him later in the game, or attempting to anyway before a gang of luchadores attack them on the road and blow up a bridge. Like what the fuck, why? Why would you ever kill such a popular character in a way like that? And don't give me that shit that Johnny didn't gel with the series new direction either. If anything, he was the perfect fit for this game's new tone. In the previous two games, he's characterized by his arrogance, over the top nature, 
and solving his problems with as many bullets and explosives as he needs. Apparently, the writers killed him off because he had a reputation for being invincible, so they decided to shock the players by showing he wasn't? It's such an awful ass pull. Like a shitty Vince Russo storyline on WCW. That's why this company's in the shape it's in because of like this. Gives me some Last of Us 2 vibes and how terribly it's written and how defensive the devs got when criticized for it. And yes, before anyone says it, I know he comes back in Saints Row 4, but it stinks of the writers walking back their decision because of all the backlash. So the game isn't exactly off to the best start narrative wise, but some good gameplay and fun characters should be enough to salvage it, right? I'd say yes, but there's a reason this game divided the fanbase so badly. Before diving into the meat and potatoes of the game, let's talk about the new setting, Steelport. Its design is influenced by Pittsburgh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, and New York City, which makes sense as I was getting some serious GTA 4 Liberty City vibes driving around, just with a more vibrant color scheme. The city is okay, but feels more like a video game city than it does an actual city like Stillwater. Stillwater had some real diversity to its areas, the different parts of the city unique enough from each other I could easily figure out where I was on the map by quickly looking around. Steelport is laid out in such a way in order to make it as convenient as possible to drive through and not get lost. With the same important locations dotted around each district, so you don't have to drive too far to find a clothes shop or friendly fire or whatever. There aren't any real unique or memorable locations like the huge underground mall or the university. So it all kind of blends together. It's not a terrible map. And I do like that it'll change after certain missions to reflect the damage the Saints have caused to it. But it certainly feels underwhelming compared to Stillwater. While at its core, Saints Row the Third is still an open sandbox third person shooter. It's added some new features and reworked older mechanics to create a more streamlined experience. Combat is a weird one here, as while it's considerably easier compared to the first two games, it can also be more annoying. It's easier in the sense that you now have regenerating health, so if shit gets dicey instead of scarfing down burgers from freckle bitches, you can just hide and wait for your health to fully recover. Because of this, freckle bitches is gone now, replaced instead by tits and grits. Though you can't enter or buy anything here. I'm a man-child who loves bad jokes and big tits. So it's still got a chuckle out of me though. Then there's your enemies, who are paradoxically extremely inept in combat, but also obnoxiously resilient. Basically, they're Homer Simpson in that one episode where he's boxing hobos, and his whole strategy is just to eat hits and tire his opponents out. Until he fights Dredrick Tatum, who decimates Homer because he has piercing on his boxing gloves like Orin in Final Fantasy X. Enemy AI was never particularly special in the first two Saints Row games, but they were effective. You couldn't just run out into the open and fight a group of them. Otherwise, they'd shoot you to pieces. Here, more often than not, they'll sometimes stand around for several seconds just staring at you before they decide to shoot, or get stuck on objects in the level and leave themselves as sitting ducks. Despite that though, it will take you a bit of effort to actually kill these idiots, as they are very spongy or can feel that way as your weapons are seriously underpowered. Like outside of the special weapons they hand out like candy, your basic weapon set of pistols, machine guns, shotguns, rifles, and shit even grenades feel like nerf toys. That's because we have a new weapon upgrade system. Well system is being really generous, but when heading to friendly fire you can now pay to upgrade your guns. Each weapon you obtain has to be upgraded individually with increasing prices for each level of upgrade, buffing their damage, accuracy, ammo clip, giving you dual wielding, and even adding status effects like incendiary bullets or shock bullets. I'm kind of mixed on it. Upgrades aren't exactly expensive, so it's not really cumbersome to max out a weapon if you got the cash. On the other hand, you can quickly make yourself too overpowered and every fight a cakewalk. The devs must have realized that too, so they've added some enemy variety by introducing the new specialist type. There are four specialist types introduced, one for each gang and the last shared between all three of them. 
for the Morning Star, you have a Agent 47 knockoff that's equipped with the McManus sniper rifle. For the Deckers, we got a Cyber Goth girl who zooms around like the Flash, making her tough to actually hit. And the Luchadores got a beefy guy with a mohawk wielding a grenade launcher. All three gangs will also employ a brute, a bald mountain of muscles strong enough to send you and your car flying, that can soak up a ton of damage and also comes in variants with a minigun and a flamethrower. Out of the specialists, they're easily the worst as outside of their huge strength and defense, they tend to stick to you like glue, ignoring your homies to focus solely on killing you. Outside of the brute, I don't know that the specialists really add enough to encounters. The Morningstar's sniper is only really a nuisance when your notoriety is too high and they're shooting at you from a chopper. The Luchadora's specialist kind of blends in with the rest of his group, so a good chunk of the time I end up killing him without even noticing. Only the Decker's cyber goth girl is of any real note, as she drags out encounters if you can't manage to hit her. They don't really make encounters feel more dangerous, or like you need to prioritize killing them first. Really, it just keeps fights from feeling too samey, and too much like Saints Row 2, which is probably why they lean more towards spectacle in certain missions and fights, giving you crazy or wacky weapons to decimate everything around you, like the Penetrator Dildo Bat, which for some reason seems to be the iconic weapon for this game, which is ironic considering San Andreas had the oversized dildo you could use years earlier. Then you get the Reaper Drone that's handed to you during the first mission in Steelport, basically just a Predator Missile Killstreak from Modern Warfare 2, or the Cyber Cannon, which is basically just a Mega Buster from the Mega Man series. These weapons are pretty fun to play around with. They just feel out of place in a Saints Row game, and feel like stuff you'd see in a game like Fortnite. Continuing with the gameplay changes, let's move on to the respect system. In the first two games, respect was basically like a currency you had to earn and spend in order to do main story missions. In the first game, I hated it, as it felt like it really padded out the game and I spent more time doing side activities than the story. The second game fixed it by introducing the style rank system that increased the amount of respect you'd earn meaning you needed to do fewer side activities in order to earn enough respect ranks to do missions. Here, they reworked respect into an experience and leveling system. They're no longer needed to do missions, and in fact, missions will now pay out respect instead. The higher your respect level, the more upgrades are unlocked for your character, which you can access on your phone and purchase with money once you've unlocked them. This includes things like faster health regen, a health increase, carrying more ammo for your weapons, taking less damage from certain types of attacks, decreasing notoriety, upgrade for your homies, and more. The first two games would lock these upgrades behind the side activities instead, requiring you to complete a certain rank in order to earn them. This simpler and streamlined approach, while certainly more convenient for the player, ends up robbing a real need to do the side activities here outside of 100% completion. Don't worry though, the developers made sure to repurpose them in the worst way imaginable. So unlike the videos on the first two games, I won't be doing my mission by mission commentary, partially because I want to start phasing that out of my videos and cut down on the bloat, though the GTA 5 video will probably still follow that structure like my other GTA videos. It kind of just works better for that series. But the bigger reason is that the mission variety in Saints Row III is god awful compared to the first two games. Right off the bat, there's a lot less missions compared to the last two games. Shrinking the runtime to about 10 to 12 hours on a first time playthrough, that's about half the length of Saints Row 2. That could easily take you between 20 to 25 hours to be. With less missions, you would think they would be more original and memorable. But uh, that's not the case, as the developers shamelessly repurposed side activities for a good bulk of the game's mandatory missions. Side activities rarely, if ever, played an important part in the overall story. Just there as side content to grind respect, earn cash, and get some unlockables. The first two games would give you one or two mandatory side activities to do, but those were basically tutorials introducing you to the concept of them and why you should do them. In fact, outside of grinding for a reputation and 100% completion, you could ignore most of the side activities and still take over all the territory in the city and make decent cash from hood payouts. 
Here though, a whopping 14 side activities have been repurposed as mandatory story missions, not only making up the bulk of missions for your new homies, but also repeating the same missions with a different skin. These missions have very flimsy ties to the plot, have you just speaking to your homie over the phone and not even interacting with them in a cutscene, and tend to be so easy you're done with them in minutes. What's worse is that there's fewer variety to the side activities this time around, and only three new ones. You've got Guardian Angel where you ride a chopper and protect a homie as they drive around while you use a rocket launcher and sniper rifle. Professor Genki's super ethical reality climax, which is actually a lot of fun and has you going through a death arena game show, killing mascots, earning cash and points as you race to the other end. And then Tank Mayhem, which is just regular mayhem, except you're using a tank to destroy everything around you instead. Tiger Escort and Cyber Blazing don't count as new activities, as they're just reskins of the existing Escort and Trailblazing missions that are also in this game. So we got no Demolition Derby, Fight Club, or Septic Avenger in this game. And drug trafficking got reworked into just trafficking, as the dealers you're protecting this time around are just selling bootleg merch or magazines. Looks like they were trying to sand off the edges from the series way before we got to the reboot. If you played this game first like I did, you wouldn't even notice and it probably wouldn't bother you. But coming off the first two games, it just stinks of laziness. Like what the hell happened? You guys had three years after Saints Row 2 to work on this game. How the hell did you end up reusing old content and offering less new content? Outside of the mandatory side activities feeling lazy, making it harder to connect to your new homies, making them shallow as a result and making the boss feel like a flunky since they're being ordered around by their new recruits, it completely changes the structure of the side content and city takeover. It used to be that you would play a side activity in a given area, increasing its level of difficulty as you passed and earning some unlockables as a reward for reaching certain levels. In the first game it went as high as 8 levels, and in the second as high as 6. The increasing difficulty levels were easily done in one go in the same area. Here though, there's only 3 difficulty levels, with easy, medium, and hard versions of a side activity scattered around Steelport instead of being in one place. Since unlockables like new rides, less notoriety, or less damage from weapons aren't tied to the side activities anymore, it makes sense why they'd scale the different levels down to 3. To make up for that though, you now need to complete a side activity to take over different parts of the city. And some of these harder activities are brutal unless you cheese it with the right vehicle or weapon unlock. Taking over the city is completely different now. It used to be you would acquire a gang's territory by winning it from them in a story mission, or by taking over one of their strongholds, requiring that you take over all their available territory before you could unlock their final mission and take what's left. They would sometimes try to take the territory back, but it was so infrequent in the last game, and easy enough to push them back that it was a non-issue. Owning their territory also meant you could buy into the businesses in that territory, earning discounts on purchases, and a higher passive income from that area. Here, you'll still gain territory from completing missions, but you can immediately buy into a business to gain a percentage of that territory and the perks it offers. Since it skips this crucial step of, you know, fighting a gang for their territory, it effectively gets rid of the stronghold missions. There are story missions where you quite literally take over one of their strongholds and add it as a safe house, but it's not the same thing. In the first two games, strongholds were mandatory side missions that had you screwing up or taking over an enemy's gang operations. They were required to be done in order to unlock a gang's final mission and also needed respect in order to do them but they were varied enough and had different objectives to them, so it didn't feel like I was doing the same mission five times in a row. The replacement here is gang operations, where a given gang is just crowded up in a certain spot, doing whatever, playing dice or with Beyblades or something, I don't know. They're not marked on your map, so you have to wander around and stumble upon them yourself, which isn't too hard as checking your map you can piece together roughly where one is based on what territory isn't taken over and doesn't have a business you can buy. Once you find one, just kill everyone there and instantly win that territory, earning a cash and respect payout. 
it's the exact same thing every single time. And since you don't automatically aggro your enemies as soon as you find a gang operation, it can be stupidly easy to clear if you have a rocket launcher or grenades. The only thing you remotely have to worry about is the high notoriety you'll have for attacking the gang, as their friends will start spawning all over to get revenge. But that's not much of an issue either, as unlike the last game where you had to go to a forgive and forget to clear your notoriety, here you can just safely run into a business or safe house you own to lose it instead. Or later on you can unlock a perk where you can call someone to clear the notoriety instead. This is what I meant about how this game's flaws become way more obvious after playing the first two games. Everything that made the series unique or offered some kind of challenge has been completely removed or streamlined to be stupidly easy. This also changes the structure of the game's story. As before, you could take on any gang's story in any order you wanted and switch between them as long as you had the respect to start them. It added some replayability to the game as you can change up the experience on subsequent playthroughs. Here it's entirely linear, as outside of the reused side missions you have to do, the game plays out the exact same way each time. First taking down the Morningstar, then the Deckers, then the Luchadores, and finally Stag, the totally not Ultor again fourth faction that shows up. Okay, so outside of that, and the missions that are quite literally go here to see a cutscene, how does the new original missions in Saints Row the Third hold up? Well, I brought this up in my Mafia video when discussing the Definitive Edition and AAA game design in general, but the word I would use to describe them is spectacle. I went over the opening already where you're robbing a bank. Outside of the stupid Johnny Gat bobbleheads, it wouldn't feel too out of place in Saints Row 2. It's over the top, sure, but still somewhat grounded. The police that are after you even mention that Troy won't be able to protect the saints this time around. Your antics have some consequences for a change as you do end up arrested. The following mission after negotiations with the syndicate fall through, you'll fight your way through the plane before jumping off with Shandi, free falling to try and catch her and killing Morningstar members shooting at you. Once you do reach Shandi, you'll drop her, shoot out the window of the plane you just jumped out of, jump back in to try and go after the syndicate boss before jumping back out again to catch Shandi again. In Steelport, the first order of business is to get some firepower to fight the syndicate, which involves raiding a guard armory, fighting off the heavily armed men there and using a reaper drone strike to destroy the tanks that show up before Pierce whisks you away to safety. Now so far, it's not too bad, mostly running on the rule of cool rather than logic, it's definitely escalated way faster than anything in the previous games. Honestly, both of these missions would make way more sense towards the middle or the end of the game, but it's fine. Since the Saints are at their most powerful here, and aren't building themselves up again like the last two games, there's not really a need to take the slow approach to mission design. Saints Row 2 did the same thing, what with the boss breaking out of prison and then saving Johnny at the courthouse, though things slowed down considerably after the fact. No, it's not till we get to the mission party time that we go full on spectacle. The Saints need a new base of operations in Steelport, and Shandi's ex-boyfriend's apartment isn't going to cut it. So the boss decides to take over a penthouse belonging to Philippe Lauren and the Morningstar. You'll parachute in, start killing guests, meet up with more of the Saints who assist in the takeover, before chasing and escaping Morningstar Lieutenant by helicopter, and cornering him to get info on his boss. Okay, so what makes this a spectacle exactly? Hell, it plays like a stronghold mission would in the last game. Well, it's because Kanye West's power is playing while you're shooting up the penthouse. You know how movies need to hype up a scene or make it seem cooler than it is? So they play a licensed track over it to try to rile you up? Think how they played Gangster's Paradise during the initial Sonic trailer with his original shit design? Or in any scene in any of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies? That's exactly what they're doing here. It's not always going to land for everyone, but for me personally, I'm seriously over it. I don't mind them in certain movies. The right song paired with the right scene can create some really iconic moments. Like the scene in Shrek 2 where Shrek and his friends are storming the castle to stop Princess Charming and holding out for a hero is playing during it. Granted, it's justified in story because the fairy godmother is singing it during the scene as Fiona dances with Prince Charming. But it fucking works. 
The same song plays in the final level of Saints Row the Third, but doesn't really land as well. I'm just not keen on it as of late, because it feels completely overused and the song choices can feel so jarring. Like that one scene in the Mario movie where Take On Me starts playing. It's so out of place and replaced original music that made way more sense for the scene. In a game though, it often feels like a crutch to get some superficial excitement from the audience and can feel really distracting. I've said this before, but a game should be carried by its gameplay first and foremost. If what I'm doing is fun and engaging, it doesn't matter what's playing in the background or if things are exploding around me. If you want to set a scene or project a certain tone, music is absolutely fine. But it should be the game's original score and not whatever the top 100 billboard song of the month that was popular on its release. That might sound a bit hypocritical coming from me, as if you watched my Vice City video, you'll remember I said that the game doesn't feel right without Michael Jackson's Billie Jean. The difference though is that's a song on the radio that just so happened to play the first time you got in a car. It wasn't played over the scene of you fighting off Sonny Ferrelli and his goons. It served the purpose of establishing that, yes, this is in fact the 80s. Look, I like Kanye West's power. The song felt really played out like a month after its debut, and more so now 13 years later, but it's not a bad song. I wouldn't even say it's out of place in a Saints Row game. It's just playing it loudly over the mission as opposed to just having it on the radio, makes it feel like the game is trying to make the scene way cooler and more epic than it actually is. To Saints Row the Third's credit, it isn't doing this constantly, but the handful of times it happens do feel more distracting than cool. Like outside party time and the final mission, you got Joe Esposito's You're the Best Around playing during a big wrestling brawl, which just does not land. The song is best known from the Karate Kid, it makes sense in like a cutscene for a training montage, but during a giant wrestling match that's a parody of WrestleMania, something like Real American by Rick Derringer would have made way more sense. Especially since Hulk Hogan voices one of the new homies, Angel. It's not the worst thing in the world. It's just that the first two games didn't need to use a song to make scenes feel awesome. Closest you got is Pierce singing So Sick during one mission, and that's more a gag because he's awful at it. Side note. We also get the boss singing What I Got by Sublime in one mission, which I absolutely love, especially Laura Bailey's take on it, and because it reminds me of Dave Mira's BMX. Early in the morning, rising to the street, light me up that cigarette and I'll strap shoes on my feet. You got to find a reason, a reason things went wrong. I got to find a reason why my money's all gone. But again, she's singing over the radio, and it's not played while she's blowing up a nuclear power plant or something. Also, one more side note, since we're still on the topic of music, I love the radio stations in this game, specifically the mix and the adult swim station. Nothing beats driving around while the Venture Bros theme plays. Go Team Venture! I don't know, they just do that. Music choices aside, it does lean into spectacle with its choice of set pieces that, while fun, again can feel out of place in a Saints Row game. You got that one mission where you get uploaded into the Decker's mainframe, where everything looks like it's straight out of the movie Tron. You shoot things with a Mega Buster and fight Matt Miller's avatar that looks like Bahamut from Final Fantasy. This whole virtual world apparently inspires the same idea used in Saints Row 4, for better and for worse. Then there's the mission where you accidentally release a chemical gas into a part of Steelport, turning the residents into zombies. my life. 
with Mayor Burt Reynolds asking you to destroy the gas canisters and stop the zombies. This mission sucks ass by the way. Zombies spawn infinitely, are as fast as you are, can stun lock you, and spontaneously catch on fire. Drags out what should be a fun power fantasy killing zombies into a long and boring ass mission. Like I said, I'm not going over every single mission, but overall I'd say the original stuff that isn't recycled content is good and fun for the most part. While you lost the freedom of tackling the gangs in whatever order you want, the game does add a tiny bit of replayability. After certain key missions, you're presented with a choice regarding something you're about to do, like whether to blow up a building or keep it, keep a sample of the zombie virus or destroy it, etc. These choices don't impact the story, except for the one regarding the final mission, but I'll talk about that later. They just change your reward for the end of a mission, like whether to take a huge cash payout now or receive a permanent percentage increase to your daily income or the choice to have zombie homies or unlocking Burt Reynolds as a homie with the option to call in the city SWAT team for backup. It's something, I guess. Honestly, the decisions feel very lopsided, as the majority of them offer a choice that is just flat out better than the other. It kind of feels like they threw it in last minute as a dig at GTA 4 and its choice system, which outside the final mission didn't feel like your choices really mattered that much either most likely why they removed the feature and lampshaded in the next Saints Row game. So what's next? What's next is you go back to Stillwater. What? No, this is my fight too. Girl, you don't get messy. Let us take care of business. Fuck you, I'm doing this for Johnny. All right, well, if we're gonna bring in the boys, we're gonna need a new place. You're worried about real estate? We have guns. Let's use them. Relax, Shambi. We got it all covered. Alrighty, let's dive into the characters, cause holy shit do I have a lot to say. Let's start with the boss. As always, you can customize their appearance to your heart's content. Choose their gender and their voice. Like last time, I went with a female boss and slapped some magumbos on her. Unfortunately, Katie Samine, or Samine, who did female voice one in the previous game, wasn't brought back for this one. So this time around, female voice one is provided by Laura Bailey, who most of you probably know for her iconic performance as... That's right, Keiko Yukimura from Yu Yu Hakusho. Look, we've both been doing some growing up since we last saw each other. You, for instance. <laughs> Is it just these pants, or did you really get a nice ass? Just can you jerk! <laughs> Haven't grown up that much! <laughs> God, I love that anime so much. Laura is perfect as the boss in this game. She brings the right tone to her that suits the boss's more mellow and goofball attitude. But she can be serious when push comes to shove. In the last game, the boss was this borderline unlikable asshole constantly escalating shit with her enemies, being outright mean and belittling her homies. She softens up a little towards the end of the game, but not because she learned a lesson, but more so because no one was left to oppose the saints at the end. While I appreciate the boss not being a total bitch for no reason, I think they mellowed her out too much, as she almost comes off as a doormat sometimes. In the last game, fitting their role as the new leader of the saints, the boss was giving out orders and running the majority of the plans against their rivals, usually asking for whatever homies she put in charge of a gang, to gather info or assist with whatever scheme she's cooked up. Here, not so much. Feels more often than not, the boss is just along for the ride as another character comes up with an idea or puts them to work for a favor. This is best shown after recruiting the new homies Zemos, Kinsey, and Angel. Right off the bat, all three of them have you doing busy work in the form of side activities for them, which comes off as you trying to prove yourself to them. Yeah, they don't know you personally, but this would make more sense if you were some unproven newbie like in the first game. Here though, the saint's reputation already precedes them. And more importantly, the boss saved all three of these assholes' lives before recruiting them into the saints. So not only do they owe her, but they should be the ones proving themselves and justifying their place in the saints. This is more a problem with recycling side activities as missions, as in the previous game they would be tied to an NPC unaffiliated with the Saints, and were side jobs for making cash. 
so it made more sense you were doing the more menial work. The boss does get better as the game goes on, and is usually the one to push the obvious or more brute force solution to their problems, but she falls short in one place, and that's her reaction and handling of Johnny's death. Out of all the saints, she's known him the longest, and has the closest relationship with him. Especially after Aisha's death in the last game, Johnny was the only other saint besides the boss who refused to drop their flag. The two of them rebuilt the saints together, and worked to take down Ultor by the end of the game. While she is upset after Johnny's death, and her war against the Syndicate is motivated by that, it just doesn't feel like she's upset enough. She has to be reminded constantly about how the Syndicate killed Johnny, that they aren't doing enough against them, and doesn't seem visibly phased when they do something like ambush the saints at his funeral. Which, I'll remind you, we had something similar with Johnny at Aisha's funeral, who was unwilling to fight Shogo and the Ronin there until the little prick pushed him too far. In making the boss more mellow and approachable, the writers forgot the person who actually cared about their homies, who, not two seconds after busting out of prison, risked going right back by storming the courthouse to save her friend from the death sentence, who was visibly distraught when her actions led to Carlos' death, forcing the boss to put him out of his misery. But this game is all about being over the top, wackiness and explosions. Can't go having a serious moment that might put players off. All the anger and sorrow surrounding Johnny's death is bizarrely poured into Shandi instead. Put in your tampons and let's do this. Oh man, Shandi, I don't think I've ever seen a character be retooled and changed so much in between two games. Maybe outside of Ethan from Condemned Criminal Origins. Seriously, how do you go from a normal looking cop in the first game to this 2000s edgelord in the second? Might take a look at that series in the future. In Saints Row 2, Shandi was your mellow, pot-smoking homie who lacked the brute force of your average saint, but made up with it by being resourceful and finding information, mostly thanks to the network of ex-boyfriends she had. She had dreadlocks, dressed like a college skateboarder, was voiced by Liza Dushku, and more or less worked to try and get the boss to chill the fuck out every once in a while. Here though, Shandi basically swapped personalities with the last game's version of the boss, and is the complete opposite of herself in every way. First, she's been recast, now played by Danielle Nicolette, who is... Oh wow, she's Cecile on The Flash? Huh, did not know that. Man, did that show really run itself into the ground? At least its ending was better than Supernatural's. Next is her appearance. Looking what I could best describe as a sexy biker or gangster costume you'd buy at Spirit Halloween. Now rocking tight leather pants, boots, either wearing a push-up bra under her top or getting some implants in between games, trading out the dreadlocks for a standard ponytail. I wouldn't call Shandi's original look iconic, but it was simple and helped her stand out compared to the other saints. Here, she looks like a generic, hyper-sexualized character you'd see in any number of Xbox 360-era shooters. I don't even think they meant to sexualize her more, either. I mean, she was already pretty hot. And shit, they even had Shandi and Playboy to advertise Saints Row 2. This design and her new personality makes me think she was actually meant to be the boss. I say that because she seems to be the only one genuinely angry about Johnny dying. Constantly getting pissed at the other saints anytime they goof off or are unwilling to retaliate against the syndicate with force. Everything she does or wants to do in the game is solely motivated by Johnny's death. And it makes zero sense. Ignoring that she went from being the most level-headed saint to its most hot-headed, Shandi and Johnny have no relationship with each other. Shit, I don't think they share a scene or even speak to each other in Saints Row 2. She's pretty much always paired with the boss or Pierce. Ignoring that you can play as a male boss, this Shandi is the same character as the boss in Saints Row 2. Like, I don't know the exact specifics of what the development of Saints Row the Third were, but I wonder if they had the script and some of the characters already done before they decided on a softer and wackier tone for the game. Then they realized that the old version of the boss was too unlikable and clashed heavily with this new direction, so they drew up plans for the new boss and reused what they already had for Shandi. Her new look makes more sense for the boss too, since the player can dress them up however they want, and it's just standard sex sells character design they can use for marketing. Otherwise, nothing in-game really explains this glaring change in character, 
Like they really try to sell you on the idea the Saints sold out and forgot who they were when they became celebrities, using that to explain away the inconsistency with their previous portrayals. But it's a plot point that goes nowhere. Johnny is the only one to bring it up before he dies 10 seconds later. And the gang does nothing to shed their new celebrity status. They own a chain of Planet Saints clothing stores, have billboards advertising themselves and the products they sell, and even take photos with people on the street. By the end of the game, they're still the same celebrity gangsters, even filming that movie that was discussed during the opening text crawl. At the very least, they do end up mellowing out Shandi in the next game, but here, she's just not Shandi. The only returning saint from the last game, mostly because he didn't die in the last one, or in this one, is Pierce. He's fine, I guess. In the last game, he was a bit of a goofball and characterized as being insecure, that he didn't get enough opportunities to prove himself to the boss, being kind of whiny at times. He gets some light ship tease with Shandi, who would mess with him and take credit for his ideas as a joke. Here, he dropped his whinier aspects and is more competent, mainly because Johnny is dead and he's picking up the slack. They sort of hint that he and Shandi might be an item now, or were, but it's only brought up once and goes nowhere. Pierce doesn't really have much of a role in the plot outside the first act. If anything, he spends more time playing chess with Oleg than actually doing anything. Well, I guess I should go over the new homies introduced, though there really isn't a lot to say about them. Philip likes his things custom made, and for his brutes, I am the master pattern, you see. Why are you still strung up if they already cloned your ass? The copies are flawed. They have my brawn, but not my brain. I can help you. The last time a big naked dude said he could help me, it did not end well. What could he do anyway? Those wires and shit are probably keeping him alive. Trust me, I'm still strong enough to kill Philippe. Oleg is this Russian kingpin knockoff that you recruit when you find him naked and strung up in the Morning Star's tower. It turns out he's being held captive by them as all the brutes you fight are cloned from his DNA. Oh yeah, there's clones in this game. You could tell it's just meant to be a meta tongue-in-cheek joke to explain why all the brutes use the same character model. The whole cloning thing isn't really brought up again until the DLC. But that's to trick you into thinking Johnny's alive when a brute clone of him is running around. There isn't much to Oleg. He's a very intelligent and sophisticated guy, unlike the abominations created from his DNA. He's essentially the muscle for the saints, letting you have your own brute for the bigger missions with way more enemies in them. Sorry about making you, you know, pull us around. This is a rescue, right? <laughs> this ain't some elaborate setup for a gang bang. Why you gotta put that image in my head, bro? Oh, I'll go with rescue then. <laughs> I would shake your hands, but them floors were a little sticky if you know what I'm saying. Next, we got Zemos. He's a pimp with a really annoying auto-tune voice who was being held captive by the co-leaders of the Morning Star, the De Winter Sisters. He was the biggest pimp in town until the sisters took over his racket and kept him locked up in their BDSM club until the boss set him free. Or they locked him up because he slept with one of them and he doesn't remember which. I don't know, I wasn't paying too close attention to his explanation. Zemos is the least developed and easily the most forgettable of the new saints. Honestly, he feels like he was meant to be a one-off NPC attached to a side activity, like we had in the last two games, as he fits right in with both the escort and pimping missions, which, of course, are reused here as missions for him. He also disappears from the plot after you take down the Morning Star. I thought someone who just got out of captivity would want to live it up a little more. Not really. I hate people. Oh. Okay, so do you have anything on the Deckers? Not yet. Okay, then what have you been doing since you got out? Power leveling. You're killing me, Kinsey. Then we got Kinsey Kensington, a former FBI agent who was going to expose the syndicate until they found out, framed her, and ruined her career. You end up saving her when you're in search of someone with tech skills to assist against the Deckers. Kinsey is probably the best of the new batch of saints, but that's mostly because she's the most fleshed out and has some actual importance to the plot. She's a bit neurotic, kind of a conspiracy theorist, lacks some social skills, but is pretty effective in getting information, hacking systems, and has a rivalry with the leader of the Deckers, Matt Miller. Kinsey's also a cute nerdy girl, 
which is a nice little bonus. You're not one of Lorenz's brutes. And you are not one of Kilbin's luchadors. Next we got Angel, or Ángel de la Muerte. Yes, I pronounced his name in both English and Spanish, but the game does too. He's a former luchador who has a vendetta against his ex-wrestling partner, rival, and leader of the Luchadores gang, Kilbane. The pair started the Luchadores gang together, but Kilbane grew jealous of the respect Angel had in the gang, so he unmasked him, shamed him, and sent him into hiding. He's voiced by Hulk Hogan, who you might recognize from the Oscar-nominated masterpiece Three Ninjas High Noon at Mega Mountain, where he teams up with Rocky, Colt, and Tum Tum to stop Lonnie Anderson. Yeah, I'm just doing a bit, but I want to see if anyone else remembers and likes the Three Ninjas movies like me. That one definitely sucked, but the first three were okay. Hulk Hogan as Angel is such a wasted opportunity. Like you have one of the best and charismatic wrestlers of all time, voicing a wrestler in your game, and it just sounds like Hogan after he found out his wife was divorcing him. Damn! Why are you living in this shithole? To remind me of what Kilbane took from me. It keeps me focused. A lot of people like to shit on Hogan's acting chops. And yeah, he's not great outside the ring. And has like no range. But when you just have him act like a wrestler, he does pretty good. Come on, he was amazing as Thunderlips in Rocky 3. The thing is, Angel is mopey and has this defeatist attitude since he was shamed by Kilbane. So it kind of makes sense he sounds depressed during your first interactions with him. It's not until he proves himself and works with the boss to get his mask back that he finds the strength to fight back against Kilbane. Unfortunately, he's only really used in one more mission where he fights Kilbane in the ring and you need to stop the Luchadores from interrupting the fight before you tag in and beat Kilbane yourself. Then he just kind of disappears from the plot outside of a few lines here and there. Ángel de la Muerte just doesn't have enough to do or develop enough where he can go full-on Hulkamania. Honestly, Hogan would have made way more sense as Kilbane. He has more screen presence, usurps the position of Big Bad, and is basically a heel wrestler, which would be perfect to channel some Hollywood Hogan into. I didn't realize you were a patron of the arts, Viola. We never really had the chance to chat. What, with you being a science experiment? I wouldn't piss off the big guy. <sighs> Look, I'm not here to fight. We need to work together. Finally, the last of the new saints is Viola de Winters, who's voiced by the oh-so-lovely Sasha Gray, who you might recognize from Entourage, where she played herself and dated Vincent Chase during that season. And porn. You know her from porn. If you say you don't, you're a damn liar. Viola starts as your enemy, working directly under Philippe Lauren with her twin sister Kiki, and acting as the leaders of the Morning Star in his stead. But after some plot stuff happens, a small power vacuum is created for a leadership of the Syndicate, which Kilbane usurps over the sisters. And after Kiki mouths off one too many times, he breaks her neck and kills her, causing Viola to switch sides. She's the most serious of all the new saints, working as a comedic foil to some of their antics, has some good business sense, and that's about it. Viola is more characterized from her time in the Syndicate, and the hostility and mistrust the Saints have towards her when she joins up. She's better than Zemos and Angel, but that just comes from being a former enemy. Otherwise, she's just another person to help the boss, and who needs to get saved later on. You have any idea who you're fucking with here? Of course. A remarkable likeness. These visions are Viola and Kiki, and I am Philippe Laurent, chairman of a multinational organization called The Syndicate. Never heard of it. Evidently not, or you would not have robbed our bank. Perhaps you wonder why you are still breathing at this point. So, the villains. Yeah, they kind of suck. The Syndicate is made up of three gangs working together to rule Steelport. The Morningstar, the Deckers, and the Luchadores. On paper, it might look like the developers ditched the take down three gangs plot of the last two games, but not really, since each group works independent from the other and never work together to fight the Saints. 
And you're once again taking them down one by one. Just in a linear order this time. Really, it's just a worse version of the second game's plot. As we also have a fourth faction, a future paramilitary group named Stag, that are basically just Ultor again. Outside of their generic ass name, the Syndicate could have had some real potential and been a genuine threat to the Saints. While the boss and the crew didn't know during the opening bank heist, the safe full of money they attempted to steal belonged to the Syndicate. Using their influence, they first ensure that the Saints go to jail and can't bribe their way out before freeing them and later interrogating them. Philippe Loren will introduce himself to the Saints, warns that he isn't one to be trifled with, and demands a huge cut of their earnings, or else die. Naturally, the Saints don't take the deal, escaping captivity and Johnny fucks up the old man's face, which Loren has him killed for. As cheap as Johnny's off-screen death is, it's a good way to set up the Syndicate as a legitimate threat that is nothing like they've faced before. Further emphasize when they're able to freeze all the Saints' money and assets. Then, like an hour into the game, you kill Loren by crushing him under a giant steel ball, and cartoon villain Kilbane takes control. Look, I get that an old evil mastermind controlling a secret criminal organization is as generic as it gets, but it's way more interesting than what we ended up with. The Syndicate being made up of three gangs means absolutely nothing. If anything, it's just an excuse as to why the gangs aren't at each other's throats for control of Steelport, like the original three gangs were in Saints Row 1. The gangs being part of the bigger Syndicate ends up making each group painfully underdeveloped. Their leaders nowhere near as memorable as someone like Benjamin King or Marrow. Since they lose their leaders so fast, the Morningstar don't have much of a presence, even when the De Winter sisters are still in charge. The Deckers are probably the most memorable of the three, though not by much, as they kind of just feel like the Ronin again but with a cyberpunk skin. Probably doesn't help that their leader is a young guy voiced by Yuri Lowenthal, just like Shogo Akuji in the last game. Matt Miller isn't whiny and inept like Shogo, has a fun little nerd rivalry with Kinsey, and the kid is smart enough to cut and run when it looks like the Syndicate are going down. Even though he's the leader of the Deckers though, he ends up being overshadowed by Kilbane, who is calling all the shots for the entire Syndicate, so he ends up feeling more like a flunky underling than a gang leader. Then there's the Luchadores, who are also pretty dull. Their name is generic as hell, and since they have a military theme to them, they kind of just blend in with the stag goons that show up. Their leader Kilbane just doesn't do it for me. Despite his size and effectively being the brawn of the three groups, he doesn't have the intimidating presence of someone like Mero. He is smarter than he looks, and rather fittingly, considering he's a wrestler, is pretty good at working the mic, successfully holding an interview on the news to turn Steelport against the Saints. But that's about all he manages to accomplish as he never really feels like a threat once he's in charge, and feels downright pathetic after a murder brawl when you unmask him. In previous Saints Row games, he would have been a lieutenant in one of the gangs that you kill before finally taking out the real leader. I'm also now realizing that's probably one of the bigger reasons the Syndicate and the gangs that make it up feel so forgettable, as each gang is only represented and run by one leader. Contrast that with the gangs from the two previous games, which had a handful of people at the top running the show. In the first game, Los Carnales were run by the Lopez brothers, with Victor acting as their near indestructible muscle. The Vice Kings had Benjamin King, Tony, Tanya, and Warren. In Saints Row 2, the Sons of Somdi had the General, Mr. Sunshine, and Veteran Child. Each group had this power structure to them, and as you went further into their storylines, you would start to whittle away at their members until only one remained. So not only did it actually feel like you were in a gang war, but you also felt yourself slowly gaining the upper hand as you dismantled their operations and killed their leaders. This might be why they introduced Stag to shake things up as the Syndicate loses their effectiveness like halfway through the game. Stag is a futuristic paramilitary group called in to deal with the escalating violence between the Saints and the Syndicate. They're led by Cyrus Temple a no-nonsense, generic, evil army general guy you've seen a million times in video games. He's not one to underestimate the Saints, and is pretty quick to push using as much force as possible against them, with an army of soldiers wearing futuristic armor, rocking laser guns, using laser tanks and jets. 
He even has a secret floating aircraft carrier like S.H.I.E.L.D. This ends up making Stag a genuine, though at times frustrating threat towards the end of the game, especially once they enforce martial law and start shooting you on sight. Cyrus is way more effective as a big bad than Kilbane. It's too bad they both have to share the title near the end of the game, as it ends up making both of them unfocused, and inevitably worse for one or the other depending on which ending you choose. Since I covered a good chunk of the story already, and admittedly there isn't really too much to talk about, I'm going to speedrun us to the ending. After dismantling the Syndicate, All Out War breaks out in the streets with Stag fighting the Luchadores. The boss will drive around with Pierce and Oleg to try and keep the peace by killing everyone who's fighting. After clearing three different battlegrounds, you'll get word that Kia, Cyrus's lieutenant that I haven't mentioned until right now, has kidnapped Shondi, Viola, and Mayor Burt Reynolds. She's planning a false flag operation by blowing up the statue on Magarak Island, killing her hostages, and framing the Staints so that Stag is given full authorization to use their secret weapon, the Daedalus. At the same exact time, Kilbane is trying to flee Steelport and escape by plane. So you're given the choice of saving your friends or stopping Kilbane, determining the ending of the game and your final mission. And they both kind of suck, but for different reasons. First, let's go with what's supposed to be the good ending, and the one that's canon, where we have to go save Shondi. Arriving at the statue, the boss has to first run around using a sonic gun to push all the explosives into the water. Once she reaches the top, and in an obvious callback to the veteran child fight from the last game, she has to fight Kia while Shondi is being used as a human shield. In the last game, you use flashbangs to get veteran child to let go of Shondi, and make himself vulnerable. Here you use bottles of farts on Kia instead. Hilarious. Killing her, the Saints are interviewed by the press, and Senator Monica Hughes declares them heroes. Mostly because Stag destroyed most of the city and instituted martial law. While the Saints saved the monument, making them look like the lesser of two evils. Cyrus stands down, but he swears he'll be back if the Saints ever step out of line again. Cut forward to an undetermined amount of time, and the boss has tracked down Kilbane's location to Mars. After some shenanigans fighting the Space Luchadores, and watching all our friends die dramatically, including Johnny, we catch up to Kilbane and kill him. But psych, that's just way too goofy. The Saints in space? Come on. Turns out they were just filming the Saints movie they were talking about way back at the beginning of the game. And the Kilbane and Johnny here are actually just actors. Roll credits. Christ, if that doesn't feel so unsatisfactory. We saved our friends, sure, but the villains just kind of got away with it all. And we end the game on a goofy space mission, with Saints still the celebrity sellouts that they were at the beginning of the game. If we take the bad ending route, and chase after Kilbane instead, the boss first needs to save Ángel de la Muerte. He'll then drive us to the airport as we chase after Kilbane. Which is a callback to the final Los Cardinales mission, where we had to shoot down the plane with Angelo on it. Only nowhere near as hard. Seriously, fuck that mission. Despite blowing up his plane, Kilbane walks out of the wreckage barely scratched. And after he monologues about how awesome he is, and how the boss is a sellout, we'll kill him in a very underwhelming QTE fight. Unfortunately, going after Kilbane means we abandon Shondi, Viola, and Mayor Burt Reynolds. With Kia's plan succeeding as she blows up the statue, kills them, and frames the saints for it. Also, I guess she killed herself too, seeing as she doesn't show up afterwards. This convinces Monica Hughes that the saints must be stopped at all cost, and so she authorizes the use of the Daedalus. Afterwards, the saints will gather at the broken shillelagh to mourn Shandi's death, though it's treated less like the boss abandoned her, and more like Shandi died in the line of duty. Also, they don't even bring up Viola, so fuck her, I guess. R.I.P. Mayor Burt Reynolds. Hearing some rumbling outside, they see that the Daedalus is a floating aircraft carrier, which is raining complete destruction onto Steelport in order to kill the Saints. The boss will then fly up there to take the fight to Cyrus, first disabling the Daedalus' cannons, before running around and planting bombs on the ship, all in memory of her dead friends, who died because of her actions. Once the bombs are set, it's a final battle against Cyrus as he flies around and shoots at the boss from a stag jet. 
Shooting that asshole down, the boss will escape the data list before it's completely destroyed. Later, the Saints will barge into the local news station and declare that Steelport completely belongs to them and create a new city-state with them in power. Roll credits. Now in terms of a final mission, this one's leagues better than the other one. As storming the Daedalus, fighting your way through, and of course killing both villains is very satisfying. Hell, the Saints declaring themselves the rulers of Steelport is very fitting and reminds me of how they took over Stillwater when taking down Ultor. The problem here though is they basically drop a bridge on Shandi and Viola, the boss sacrificing them both to feed her ego, and feeling bad about it for like two seconds. Not only that, the remaining saints are all cool with it, and don't bother to call her out for abandoning her friends. Both endings suck and made me wish you could unlock a true ending that combines the two, saving your friends, killing the villains, and going back to being gangsters. Oh, and you unlock Johnny as a zombie. Which, while it keeps the running gag of dead saints coming back as undead abominations, is kinda lame they just give them to you for beating the game. Calling eye for an eye voodoo supply made it a fun easter egg to discover, even if the entire fanbase would probably expect that by now. So what did I think of revisiting Saints Row the Third? I'll be honest, it probably left me with more conflicted feelings than any other game I've reviewed. Like I discussed at the beginning, this was my first Saints Row game, and I really enjoyed my time with it. Shit, I almost 100% it during my first playthrough. It really kept me engaged that much. It got me to go and play the others in the series. And holy shit are the differences between them way more apparent. The complete tone of the series has been flipped on its head. Saints Row wasn't exactly this gritty and serious series before this game, but it was more grounded and kept the goofiness to a minimum. The Saints were this public menace, actual gangsters. Sure, you can argue their antics are glorified because the player is controlling them, but in-game they were always treated as a threat. The public at large and law enforcement despised them, which is why Troy helped dismantle them. Here, they're shilling comic books, energy drinks, movies, and it kind of comes out of nowhere. It leans more into epic set pieces, pushing the rule of cool, regardless of whether things like plugging into the Matrix or fighting off zombies makes any sense in this series. And honestly, it's not necessarily a bad thing, because while it feels out of place, it is still fun and keeps the player engaged. It's essentially a non-stop thrill ride, the gaming equivalent of watching a newer Fast and Furious movie. Just turn your brain off and enjoy yourself, which I also have no issue with. Sometimes that's all you want, to sit down, relax, and have some mindless fun. That's why I like games like Lollipop Chainsaw, Vanquish, No More Heroes, or Onichan Bara. No need to ponder a deeper meaning or sit there reflecting on the plot or whatever. And that's ultimately why I still like this game. But good god are there some very obvious flaws compared to the last two games. Like I brought up, the game cut down on side activities while also recycling them for homie missions. Which feels so lazy when they had three years to work on this game. The characterization for the boss and Shandi just makes absolutely no sense. Which I suspect happened due to the shift in the game's tone. The syndicate are underutilized and poorly developed. It feels like they were originally meant to be one gang before they divided up its members between three gangs like the other games. They killed off the series' most popular character on a whim. No real reason outside of subverting your expectations. This is why this game divides the fanbase so much. As a sequel to Saints Row 2, it's terribly underwhelming. As a new take on the series, it's not half bad and is pretty fun which is why it would be the best-selling Saints Row, and why Volition would focus on porting and remastering this game as opposed to the first two, which desperately need it more, especially Saints Row 1, which is stuck on the Xbox 360. You know how some people will say something is a good game, but not a good blank game? Like Resident Evil 5 is a good game, but not a good Resident Evil game? Saints Row the Third is a good, if very flawed game, but whether it's a good or bad Saints Row game is way harder to determine, mainly because what even is a Saints Row game? This series has four different identities. The first two are straightforward open sandbox crime games. The third is an over-the-top action game about criminals turned celebrities. 
The fourth is a virtual reality fever dream with superpowers and an alien invasion plot that push the comedy and suspension of disbelief to its limits. And the reboot is a watered down, what if millennials were gangsters, by the numbers sandbox game made for modern audiences. You know, if Volition just stuck to one identity for the series and ran with it, then this series wouldn't have fallen off as badly as it did. I get the need to retool a series, to find a way to make it stand out and more importantly to get it to sell, which did end up working for them for a little bit, but could there have been a better approach? Like if Saints Row the Third was positioned as a spin-off set in the same universe, called Streets of Mayhem or something? Would the older fans have been more open to it since it wouldn't be looked at as a true Saints Row sequel? Oh, this is kinda wacky and a little much, but it's okay, it's just a spin-off. I don't know. At the end of the day, I still like this game. If you started with this game like I did, you probably like it too. But if you started with the originals, I can't fault you for not liking it. It just feels too different. What you enjoyed in the original two games just isn't here in the third. It's a game designed and marketed to a completely different audience. It's just unfortunate it left the original fans behind. I don't know that there really is a way to please everyone, but maybe if Volition didn't treat the first two games as something to be ashamed of, and at the very least ported the originals to newer consoles, then older fans could have something even if the series is no longer geared towards them. And that's the video. Thanks for watching, folks. Ooh, that was exhausting. It's not the most pleasant feeling when you realize something you really enjoyed has some glaring problems you didn't notice before. Is this what it means to be a true YouTube gaming critic? Now I just need a Raid Shadow Legends sponsorship, and I can take the next step in becoming a big time YouTuber. So this week was kind of weird, huh? If you live in New York like I do, or just live on the East Coast, it was kind of wild to see the Mexico filter spread across the sky for a few days. Granted, I barely go outside anyhow, so it's not like I had to worry about my health, but it sure was spooky to see outside my window. I finally got around to watching the Punisher Warzone movie, and I gotta say, I didn't hate it. It still doesn't hold a candle to the 2004 movie in my opinion, but it was pretty fun. A nice little gory action movie, though some of the sound effects are a little goofy. Ray Stevenson did a good job playing a more reserved, quiet, and brutal Frank Castle. R.I.P. buddy. Also Newman from Seinfeld as Micro is both weirdly jarring and fits so perfectly. As always, I don't have an exact layout for upcoming videos, but I think I'm going to do Black Monday next. The GTA 5 video is underway and will drop around August. I was thinking about doing True Crime New York City, but I don't know, I kind of want to skip over it and go straight to Sleeping Dogs. That game is just too damn good. I'll probably continue with Saints Row and cover the fourth game next month. Then maybe Agents of Mayhem if you guys want to see that. Otherwise I'd follow it up with the Saints Row reboot, which I'm not really looking forward to playing at all. And I might experiment more with playing games outside my usual wheelhouse. I kind of want to do a video on one of the Fallout games. But since this series has been dissected and talked about to death, I'm not sure how I would approach it. Maybe just one long ship post where I pick the worst options or something. With summer on the way, and all this free time I have, I'm planning to vacation somewhere for the first time in years to take a nice little break from my day-to-day -day life. My growth on YouTube has made it that I can actually afford to go somewhere and have some money in my bank account. So thanks for all the support, guys. I literally couldn't do it without you. I don't want to jump the gun, but I think with the money I'm saving up, that by the end of the year, I could make this my full-time job. Being able to work for myself and do something I love as my job is something I've always dreamed of. So it'd be amazing to finally pull it off. And again, thanks for watching, guys. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a like and comment down below. Which Saints Row game did you play first? Do you like the new direction the series took with this game? Or do you miss the more grounded crime games? If you're new to the channel, I'd love your support and appreciate it if you subscribed. Check out the recommended video and playlist here at the end for more of my content. Oh, and I always forget to shill it, but you can use my G Fuel code or my G Fuel affiliate code in the description below. Save yourself 30% off your next purchase. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.